matching theory. Marilda's work has international recognition and has contributed to science for a better understanding of matching processes in various social and economic problems. I'm grateful for the presence of the professor who agreed to participate in this session, Professor Aloysio Araujo of the Fundación Getulio Vargas, Professor Jesus David Pérez Castrillo of the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, Professor Mirna Wooders of the Vanderbilt University, and Professor Alvin Roth of the Stanford University, and Professor Mauricio Bugarin of the Universidad de, uh, de Brasilia. I met Marilda at the annual meeting of mathematics at the Institute of Matemática Pura y Aplicada in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. At that time, I was working on my first article of my PhD dissertation. It was on finite horizon approximation of the dynamic programming problem. The subject was related to a former publication by Marilda on the Journal of Economic Theory and some of the methodology used by her served as an inspiration to solve my problem. I remember that when I asked her for references and discussed with her what I was working on, she was very helpful and answered me and guided me through the subject. Afterwards, uh, we talked about different matters and I found, I found out that she was married uh, to a comp Patriot and friend of mine, Professor Jorge Sotomayor, an specialist in dynamical systems and ordinary differential equations. In this way, our friendly relationship grew closer. In the next years, I realized the importance and the great impact that her work had in the field of machine theory, as well as the great repercussion of its applications. I continuously became impressed with her dedication and seriousness in the work she performed. Proof of the, of the importance of these studies and the academic quality of Marilda are the more than 50 words published in works, in, in books and top quality scientific journals. In addition to being a member of, Brazilian, of the Brazilian Society of Econometrics, Brazilian Society of Mathematics, Brazilian Academy of Science. She is also a member of international societies such as the Econometric Society, Game Theory Society, and Economic Theory Society, as well as her nomination as an international honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Science. Lastly, she organized several international game theory meetings, uh, scientists from around the world, and many Nobel Prize laureates participated in them. I feel very fortunate, very fortunate to meet Marilda in person, and I felt very honored when I was invited to organize this session in her honor. She, in addition to being an international recognized scientist, is a sweet, sensitive, helpful, and caring person with her friends and family, always putting human values first. Today, she asked me to, on her behalf, thank this honor and all the distinguished professors for their participation and apologize for her absence. She cannot be present here as her husband, Jorge, is hospitalized with health problems that require special care and she's with him 24 seven. Surely she will be very happy to watch this session since it's going to be since it is recorded in her honor and the participating friends. Marilda, we love you and we wish a quick recovery for George, for Jorge. On behalf of this meeting organizer, I also thank the distinguished participants. Now we will start the session with the participation of Professor Aloysio Araujo, who will bring an account of Marilda's academic career. Uh, Aloysio, please, you have uh, at most 15 minutes. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Wilfredo. Uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to be here in, in this session in honor of Marilda Sotomayor, and I feel very happy 
from a scientific point of view and from a personal point of view. I, we have a very strong relation besides scientific and personal in different directions. We first met in the 60s where I, I was a student um, uh, uh, undergraduate, but doing the master in IMPA. And then she was doing the master in a Catholic university. But there are some joint courses. I remember one particular one in algebra that was taught in, in Catholic university. And then I went there and then I met Maria. There are some others in IMPA. It was a sort of joint program. And so we already established a relation there. And then I went to the US. And then when I came back in 1980 uh, to IMPA, uh, Marilda was doing her PhD. Uh, she decided to make the decision to PhD a little late in her life. And then uh, later than me, anyhow. But then uh, we, there was very, very warm ring counter. And then uh, Marilda was already working a problem. She was doing a PhD in a Catholic university. Uh, but uh, one important figure for in the, her thesis was Jacques Schechten. That was a colleague of mine from IMPA. And then uh, she, she was talking with him. Uh, it was in a problem in economic dynamics. Uh, a problem of income fluctuation by the subject of uh, Shackton of PhD with David Gale. And then Marilda was very involved. And then she started talking with me also. I had worked in dynamic economics before. And then we start discussing. And then we draw closer even. And then I was very impressed because many people do a PhD just for, uh, because the, she was a professor uh, uh, in the Catholic University, the mathematics department already. And then is that because they are pushing her for PhD? No, no. But immediately it was very clear that Marilda was very interested in the problem. And she even liked when I gave her a more difficult problem than <laughs> the same subject. And she told me several times along the line, oh, Luis, the problem that you gave me, <laughs> a problem that people in market economy later discussed. And she made good contributions in this direction. I was not, I was think I was a member of her committee, but I remember we discussed a lot uh, because um, we were a very small group, no? So, uh, and then I was very interested in the problem and I liked Marilda, so we discussed a lot intensely. And then she wrote some very nice papers and published in JET. In the early 80s, uh, I organized a meeting in IMPA and I, David Gale came. I don't know if she met there or she met somewhere, but she met David Gale. It was natural because Gale had been the advisor of her, one of her advisors, which was Shaq Shaq. She had an advisor from Catholic World. And then I um, David Gale told her, and she wanted to do a postdoc in Berkeley, invited her to go to Berkeley, but she told her, oh, uh, dynamic economics is interesting, but Gale had done the work also, huh? originally in this field. But said, no, matching is more interesting, I don't know. She conv convinced her to go into the direction of matching. And then her postdoc there, Berkeley, she changed. And I think it gave that indicate her to look for uh, Alvin Roth uh, uh, because he was even was more active in the field. He, David Gale, he was a pioneer, right? As it is that he passed away before the the growth of the field, you no, know, with um, Shapley and Alvin Roth that got the Nobel Prize uh, because Gale had started it with Shapley, you know, as you all know. But he was still very enthusiastic about them. Um, and that was very why well. Marilda immediately understood. She changed the, the, the research agenda 
and then she went all the way and then she wrote several papers and then had a br brilliant career. As you all know, I'm not especially for others to speak more detail because these other, uh, I'm in front of such a gigantic figures here. So I continue in a more personal basis. Uh, we have several things in common. Uh, Jorge Sotomayor was my, 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 at the house next to me in Impa. So we become a friend of him. Uh, and very young. and then to that we had this connection no, to her husband. That unfortunately, is bad health. I know because I've been to, had to talk with Maria about some other subject. It's very, very difficult because um, of his health. He lost lots of weight. I don't know exactly what, but his. Um, uh, but then I had her. also my my wife happens to be Maria, the architect. So Maria came to my house, not because of me, but because of my wife and vice versa. So we had several attachments. And also, both of us are the only one doing theory, you know, in, in Brazil. So I helped her in her career, she helped me. And then we had this uh, um, uh, relationship also. In the, the, from the Brazilian perspective, a small community that was starting there. And then, uh, uh, so we, all this year we've been very close at a very warm relationship. And Marilda is a wonderful person also because she and uh, so to my own, uh, they adopt some child and then they need special care. And then that was uh, also difficult. And she maintained that with all the, the dignity and you know, all the care it needed. Now she had also her husband. So it's, um, uh, she had health problems. So, so it's, uh, I, love, I love her a lot. And I'm a very close friend. And I'm very happy that I've been close friend for so many years. I'm giving a more personal touch, you know. But the academic is astounding, you know. Her book with um, Alvin Roth is major, you know. Uh, and then uh, we have colleagues now, the Brazilian Academy of Science, and then some other organizations. And then uh, uh, there was a very nice commemoration for her. I think, uh, I think it was 60 birthday, 65, I forgot, in Sao Paulo. It was very warm. Uh, and uh, we organized together some meetings, no? And she organized once a satellite meeting, it was a meeting that organized, it was very helpful. And it was very interesting how she got this technology organized meeting. In the beginning, she was a little hesitant, but then she learned it and she did so well. And then it's, uh, it's amazing, you know, how she entered a different stage of her career. There's another thing that scientific organizer, you no? Know? I remember in the beginning, I was talking about you, I said, no, always. But let me tell you something a little funny that uh, uh, once Marilda, on the meeting that she organized, it was with, um, uh, I tried to make, so I, I'm not very good at telling jokes, but I think that uh, there was a meeting that she organized, very good meeting, University of São Paulo, in game theory. And she had invited um, uh, Nash, also, and many other prominent uh, game theorists. And then she, she organized, had decided to pass the, the, the film, in the background, piece of the film, you know, of, um, you know, of the Brilliant Mind, I think the name of the film, or the name of the book, but I think based on the book, uh, you all know. But then uh, the idea is that when part of the film, There'll be some uh, question asked, an actual answer. And then I say, oh, okay, good. But <laughs> Nash agreed, but then he wanted the question. So Mario to send the question, huh? he said. And then Nash um, started giving some answer, no? 
by mail. You know? And then Maria de Oa Luiz, he's talking a lot about economics and about different things. You have to come with me. Say, okay, Maria, <laughs> you're a good friend, you'll be together there. <laughs> but, uh, but then uh, it was tense, no? Because what Nash would answer, no? Um, but everything came out very well. So we passed even just another episode, no? So it, uh, she know my daughters, I know hers, her son, her daughter, and then we have this family relationship and so many different directions of her scientific life, her parallel scientific life. Just in the beginning, there was some joint, you know? But then later, she went a different path, but in a bright way, but we kept closing some things all this year. Thank you for inviting me, Wilfredo, uh, and uh, I don't want to pass on any moment. Thank you very much, Aloysio, for this uh, special introduction that uh, allows us to meet uh, Mariuda uh, much more. She's a very wonderful, nice person. And uh, continue, continue with the session, I would like to invite Professor Jesus David Perez Castrillo uh, for his presentation. The title is Constraining Optimal trade-wise stable outcomes in the one-side assignment game, a solution concept weaker than the core. Please, uh, David. Thank you very much, Wilfredo. It's, uh, it's my pleasure being here. So before I, I share a screen with you with my, my slides, uh, let me ask again. So thank you very much for organizing this. I think this is, is great that, that you, you do this in the, uh, also in the framework of the, of the Association for Graduate Schools. And uh, le mando un abrazo muy, muy fuerte a Marilla y a Jorge. Eh, espero que, que es, nos recuperemos pronto y, y podamos seguir eh, hablando y trabajando pronto. So, so let, me, let, me, let me share the screen with you. Uh, so what I'm going to present um, is, a, is a joint work with Marilla. Uh, so so, uh, so we have been working with Marilla for, for many years, you know, maybe like 20 years or so. So we have a few, a few papers together. And, uh, and, and Marilla still works on many, in many old papers related to, to matching theory and, and new ideas. And uh, so this one, we, we are uh, working together. It's, it's trying to develop solution concepts for um, some matching games. And actually, uh, I will tell you a little bit later, for, we, we try to be a bit more general for environments where the classic solution concept, which is the core or stability, et cetera, do, does not exist. So we have this complicated name, which is constrained optimal trade-wise stable outcomes uh, for a particular, again, class of game, which we are going to, to call one side assignment game. We will we'll see what, what it is about. So. So the type of environments we, we have in mind in this paper are um, situations or markets where there is a single population. So it's not two-sided. So most of the work of, of Marilla uh, are in two-sided market where you can differentiate who is in one side, who is in the other side, like sellers and buyers, for example, or you know, women and men typically. But, but in this market is just everybody belongs to the same population. You can think of firms or you can think of, of people. And, and the idea is any, any pair can create value by working together. For example, imagine we are talking about R&D collaboration by firms. So imagine we are two, just by, by two people. So a firm can do R&D on, on its own, or, or it can collaborate with another firm to do R&D, or the classical situation of roommates, where, where not only who is going to be with whom in, in the room, but also how, how the cost of the apartment is going to be shared is, is endogenous, so it has to be decided, okay? So again, so, so these are markets where at the end of the day, an outcome, so what we expect to know is who is going to be matched with whom or who, and who is going to be on his own, isolated, and how the surplus is going to be shared among the among the, the, the members. Okay, so again, we, we refer to these games as one-sided, one-sided in the sense that people don't belong to two sides, but it's only one side. 
The assignment game is reference to the classic Sabrishovic assignment game. So uh, we developed a theory again. So our, our area, we like stability, like, so we've been working stability as a solution concept all our life, and we, we like stability as a solution concept, but there are many markets, and this is one, where stable allocations often don't exist. Um, and we try to, to posit a, like a theory or a view that share many classic assumptions. For example, we still assume all, everybody is rational or is rational. They are all present simultaneously in the market. They can communicate with each other freely, offers, counter offer, whatever. And everything is common knowledge. So preferences are common knowledge, rules are common knowledge. To this uh, classic uh, environment, classic hypothesis or theory, we add that what we'd say players have an optimal cooperative behavior. What does it mean in, in, our, in our sense? This means that a guy would only engage in a, in a, in a cooperation that is optimal for him in the sense that he knows very well that once he's in this cooperation, whatever happens in the future, nothing is going to change for him. So once he enters into a trade, this trade is stable in the sense. Again, whatever happens in the future, whether other people, whether other people trade or don't trade, doesn't matter. This trade is stable. Nothing is going to change for them. Okay. So this is the new thing we 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 add. So in in this paper, we introduce this idea of trade wise stable outcomes. So trade wise means so the trades that are made should be stable. And uh, we propose out of this, uh, I will be formal in 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 a couple of minutes among these trade wise stable outcomes. We propose the, the top one, so the Pareto optimal among this set as a natural solution concept for, for this game. So you, and you will see, I'll try to explain why we think of it as a natural or a regional solution concept. And we analyze, of course, the property of the set. Of, and of course, the properties of this set are, when, in our view, make it reasonable. But we also show that you know any T stable outcome, trade wise stable outcome, can be extended to this optimal. Uh, and we suggest is idealized dynamic environment where this can happen. Idealized in the sense that we are not proposing a coalition formation game or something like this, it's just a view of how could this happen. Okay, so we are not proposing any non-cooperative, uh, non-cooperative uh, sequence where this could or couldn't happen. Okay, in this process, coalitions or straights are made sequentially. And then at the end of the day, the final stage will be this constraint uh, trade wise. I will call them TS stable uh, outcomes. Okay. And again, why, why is it useful? Because uh, this is a typical example, this is a typical market where, where the core or the stable allocations are often empty. For example, you, you think of a classic, the simplest example is there are three people, three persons in this market, each couple can get one. The core is empty because uh, any trade, imagine one and two would be trading uh, one, right? One of the two is getting less than one, and then you can call the other, the, the third guy, and propose something. So the, the, the core is, is empty in this particular market. Now, this market has been, I, I will not go to the literature really, <clears throat> this market has been a little bit overlooked somehow. And um, our, our impression, our explanation is that uh, the Non-existence of stable outcomes makes it harder to make proposals about how, how what is the final outcome in this uh, in this market. So it's, it's it's complicated to analyze. So there are a few papers I, I quote uh, here uh, some, and of course uh, I'd be happy to share any, any literature to anyone interested that try to provide conditions for the code. Even finding condition when the code is empty is, is very tricky. Actually, uh, some people use graph theory or linear programming, but this is, there are no very intuitive conditions under which we can know whether the core is or is not empty. So let me go without further um, introduction to, to the framework. Um, I hope to be more or less uh, in time or, or quick. So this is set of player, right? So classic it's, framework is extremely easy. So we have a set of players and players. And again, we are interested in situations where partnership may happen. So that means pairs, okay? So AIJ would be the surplus that can be made between if players A, I, and J get together, okay? This is something which is not negative because they, they can always stick separated, right? So, so this is a non-negative number. 
measure the surplus of this relationship between A and J. We can, this is it. This is our framework, okay? You can stay together and then you get zero. So we normalize staying together, staying uh, on, on your own at zero. And AIJ measure the surplus of any relationship. This is it. Now, this uh, market can be seen and, or can be represented also through a classic uh, games in, in characteristic function form. Just by saying, look, a coalition, what is the value of a coalition? What is the maximum that the partnerships can do inside? So, this is the maximum that by forming partnership, the people in S can get. And this defined, this would define. Uh, coalition or function form as we always know in, in cooperative game theory. Okay. Yes, let me mention that uh, our, our framework is more general than the classic uh, two-sided assignment game uh, by Chaplin Shubin. The classical two-sided are like sellers and buyers, right? And we are interested in knowing uh, if each seller has a product, if buyer is interested in, in acquiring a product, uh, one unit, and then we, we want to know who is buying what, and under which price, right? So our framework is more general in the sense that we, we can think of the situation to a situation where the set N is shared between two, let's call them P and Q, that don't intersect, right? And then the value of any pair inside Q, and if you are both sellers or you are both buyers, is just zero, okay? So uh, one side the same again is a generalization of two sided assignment games, in, in fact. Now, in this game, so what uh, the solution concept, again, we are interested in knowing who is partnering, who, who is partnering with, with whom, and uh, who is getting the surplus, right? How, how the surplus is shared. So a feasible matching is just which are the pairs, which are, who, are, who is singleton. So it's, you can represent it as a, as a partition, a partition where uh, the, the elements of the partitions are either singletons, when the people stay on, on their own, or pairs, partnerships. The matching is optimal if it maximizes the total surplus. Okay, here utility is transferable, so we can maximize the sum. This is it. And, it's per, and then the payoff in this, uh, in this market is per was feasible if we can actually implement this payoff, that is, uh, we can find a matching such that uh, the payoff of the two pairs in this particular matching corresponds to the surplus. Okay, so again, this is just a way of, of sharing the surplus. The stability is what we all love in, the, uh, in cooperative game theory, for we can apply other solution concepts, but it's the most, uh, it's, it's probably the most popular and, and very sensible. One is a payoff stable. First of all, if it is integrally rational, so nobody enters into a partnership to lose money or to lose utility. And in addition, you cannot find two pairs, two, two guys who would be better off together than they are now. Okay, so this is divorce proof. I works call it divorce proof. Okay, so you cannot find uh, a player I and a player J so that if they would get together, they would be better off than they are now. And this is the stability in the sense of matching theory. You can also define the core, right? The core is defined in, in, uh, in the characteristic function form. Uh, the core is just uh, the set of payoffs that uh, sum up to the value of the grand coalition. And again, no, uh, for every possible coalition, the sum of the payoff of the people in the coalition is at least the value of the coalition. So again, no coalition has an incentive to deviate, to block the, the payoff. Okay. But again, as I mentioned in the introduction, the core may be empty. And this is, of course, a problem. Now, uh, to, introduce my, to introduce our solution concept, let me first introduce what is a trade, uh, which is the, 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 the main word in our, in our paper. So a trade is just a partnership. So a trade is two guys getting together and sharing the surplus. This is a trade. Okay, so two, two guys meet, decide how to set the surplus, we call this a trade. And, and when a guy doesn't, doesn't form any partnership, doesn't get into any trade, we call him or her inactive. And again, so we call a trade stable if none of these two guys, I and J, have any incentives to deviate. 
So none of them is part of a blocking pair. They cannot block. So we, so we say a trade in a certain outcome is stable if this happens. So you see that I'm, I'm not defining instability now for the market, I'm defining instability just for, for a trade, okay? And we say, but okay, this is a good trade because it's stable. Now, we, the definition of stability in terms of trades can be made as follow, a outcome is stable if all the trades are stable. And in addition, two inactive players can also not block uh, the outcome, okay? So not only the trades are stable, but also the inactive players cannot block. Now, concerning the core, again, it can be empty, but of course the core always has nice property and it has particularly nice property uh, in, in this market. First of all, the set of stable payoffs coincide with the core. So stability and core is the same. Actually, we'll refer to this as stable outcomes, stable payoffs. Or, and, and it has this very nice structure of uh, Cartesian product in the sense that, you know, you imagine you pick two stable outcomes, right? Remember, an outcome is a matching and a payoff pay vector. Imagine you, you pick two, and then you mix them the other way around. So you take the matching from the first one and the outcome from the second or the other way around, still stable. Okay, so it's like you can separate the set of stable matchings and the set of stable payoff because any combination is stable. And actually, not only that, but the set of matchings that are stable corresponds to the set of optimal matchings. Okay. So stability guarantees optimality. Uh, and then we have this very nice uh, Cartesian product structure between the two sets. And, and in particular, so let, let me skip this. Uh, I will try to go a little bit faster. Now, our solution concept is linked to the idea of Trade was stability or T stability. When is T stable? If all trades are stable. So it's like the people inside the trades are stable. They cannot, they cannot deviate among themselves, also even with the people outside. But we, we don't care whether two guys outside can or cannot deviate. Okay, so somehow T stability is like internal stability. So no player in the set of active players we, we call T of X can form any booking book pair with another guy in TX or with another guy in, in, on UX. But it is a weaker solution concept, of course, than the core and the st stable allocation because the stable outcome not only are internally stable, but also externally stable in the sense that no players outside uh, can block. The big advantage, of course, is the set of stable outcomes is always non empty. For example, if everybody's a singleton, since everybody's inactive, this is T stable. Okay? So there are many uh, trade wise stable outcomes. We, we focus on the best out of them. The best in the sense that they, they involve the Pareto optimal. Okay? So they're going to involve the maximum number of trades. So we call them the constraint optimal trade wise stable payoff, optimal T stable for short. Okay, so out of this set of T stable outcome, we take the largest among them, the Pareto optimal among them. And then we say the optimal T stable outcomes are outcomes that are supported by, by, by this matching and that they are the best out of the set of uh, T stable payoffs. Okay, and these are this, these two sets S is the set of uh, stable payoff, the stable payoff S star, which is going to be our solution constant in terms of payoff. This is the set of Pareto optimal payoffs in S. Now, uh, I'm going to, to present you my, my, our first main result, which is, uh, we think, very interesting uh, to, to introduce that. Again, we, we like stability, right? So this T-stable outcomes might not be stable. Again, they are internally stable, not necessarily internally stable. So they might not be stable, but they are like stable in some sense. So for example, imagine we take a T-stable outcome. Then the set of active partnership effect is part of an, stable, an optimal matching. I mean, they, they don't do anything wrong. So maybe, maybe we don't get to the optimal matching, there may be less partnership that are under optimal matching, but all the, all the partnership that are made in a TST will outcome are somehow optimal, are part of something optimal. And the same when we compare in, in terms of uh, outcomes. 
you know, we have some, in here we have some trades that have been made. Maybe this is not stable because some people outside can deviate. Can, can, maybe this is not stable, but all the trades are nice in the sense that um, if the set of stable outcome is not empty, we could extend this set to something which is stable, okay? And everybody would, everybody which is under this stable outcome would stay as, as they are. So they are still a stable outcome that extends this, this situation. And in fact, what the people in this stable outcome get is the same as they could get in any possible court page. They cannot do better than that. So our, our first theorem, our main theorem is that, okay, imagine the core is not empty. So we, can, we like the core. So the set of stable outcome is not empty. We, we like it. Okay, we, we, we give the same, okay? So our solution concept in terms of payoff coincides with the core, with the core is not empty. So that means that we are proposing a solution concept that gives you the core when, when it is not empty, but when it is empty, provides something. Okay. Give you something. And I'm going to give you some properties now uh, of this set that uh, holds not only when the core is non empty, but also when the core is empty. Okay. So there are properties that somehow generalize properties of the set of stable outcomes, also to, to environments where the stable outcomes don't exist. So again, let me escape this. The one important property is, okay, so we know that if the set of stable outcomes is empty, the, you know, the matching is not going to be optimal, okay? We, we don't reach optimality in the matching. But whatever they get, it is the same. So if you take two, in any two optimality stable outcomes, the sum of the payoffs for the people in these two stable outcomes are the same, okay? If the stable outcomes exist, then this will be the maximum. This will be stable optimal matchings. But if stable outcomes don't exist, then this is the, the best you can do. And the best you can do, you can do it in any optimality stable outcome. Okay. We call them this matching quasi-optimal matching. Okay. Again, they might not are not necessarily optimal, but this is as far as we can go. And not only this, but also this nice property of Cartesian product that I, I mentioned before for the stable outcome, which is very relevant in, in the assignment game, to say the assignment game, for example, it, it also holds in, in our environment when the set of stable outcome exists. It also holds for our, for our uh, solution concept. So that means that if you, again, you take two optimality stable outcomes, that means you have here a matching, a quasi-optimal matching, we have here a, a, a a sharing of the sur surplus, right? So a vector here the same. We mix them, it's still optimality is stable. Okay. So the same nice structure holds for our solution concept, even when stable outcomes don't exist. So I provided a, a, a solution concept that is always not empty. It coincides with the set of stable outcomes when, when this set exists. It's internally stable, probably the maximum surplus, each one of them probably the maximum surplus of the set of internally stable outcomes. When it is not, in the, when it is not the optimal, it can be extended to, to one of those. And actually also all the optimal the stable outcomes are compatible with the same set of matchings, right? So this, this looks like a, like a nice, nice solution proposal. This is our claim. I, I, I can tell you a little bit, we view this, these um, outcomes at the final, again, at the final step in some dynamic process, dynamic formation process where the people make trades, maybe one by one, maybe two by two, and they, until they arrive there. And again, the important thing is that you only make a trade, you are 100% confident that whatever happens in the future, you are going to stay in this trade. So no possibility of blocking will appear for the people in a stable trade. So for example, um, 
So, for example, uh, imagine we have this this uh, this game with seven players. You know, one player one and two can get two get three, three and four can get a super of two, one and three can get a super of three, and then five, six, and seven they get together, then they, they get one. Okay, and any, anything else gets zero. Now the code is empty because whatever five, six, and seven do, this is a little bit similar to what I, I saw you before for for the three player case. So the the code is empty. But uh, the optimal T stable outcome, the set, is, is non empty because it's, it's always non empty. And, and it involves these four guys getting together. I mean, one and two together, three and four together, they, they get the total surplus of five. So the, the quasi optimal matchings, in this case, is unique, give you a, a total surplus of five. And anything such that they share the surplus. For example, one and two should, should share three, three and four should share uh, two. Uh, Etc. Right. So one one dynamic such a dynamic process would be something like okay, if we start all everybody singleton, then maybe one and two get together, and if one and two get together, then uh, for example they share one get two, uh, um, sorry one uh, get two two get one. The important thing about this uh, about this trade it is stable because whatever the other guys do. Later in the future, whatever other trades they will make, these guys will never find it optimal to deviate from the sharing. And the same, you know, once this trade is made, and maybe the three and four can get together and get one one. Why why do we stop here? Because if five and six get together and share something, they know that some, some, someone is going to, to then meet with seven and again, they, they will never stop. Any, any other trade, any future trade will, will stop being, uh, will stop being uh, uh, stable, okay? So we, we stop there. And again, finally, the, so we have this theory about a solution concept that is uh, weaker than the core, of course, okay? It coincides with the core, with the core is, is non empty. And then give, give us something which we find uh, natural and, and, and uh, useful when the core is, is empty. And it also allows us to provide some conditions for the existence of the core. Um, so, for example, the set of stable outcome, I mean, the core is non empty if and only if every optimal T stable payoff is Pareto optimal feasible. So, again, this is not. A very friendly condition to check. Actually, it's, it's very, I mean, it's hard. I, I, as far as I know, there is no so, such a friendly condition to check whether the code is empty or not. This gives us uh, some way to check in just by looking at the uh, optimal TSC will pay off whether the code is empty or not. And finally, um, the last condition I will, I will give you, you know, if the code is, if the code is empty, that means that every TSC will Payoff is, is there is a blocking con, a blocking coalition. Someone is going can block it. Actually, we can we can show that the blocking coalition, the blocking pairs, so the blocking set of blocking agents is actually the same for every optimal stable coalition. And actually, for others, right, the, it is trade wise stable, but it's not, not optimal trade wise stable. There's some blocking pairs that will vanish as we move on in this dynamic process. No? So we start with all this possible set of uh, blocking uh, agents. And then as we move in the dynamic process, there will be less and less blocking. Until at the end, there will be a set of uh, blocking pairs, again, if the core is, is empty, which we call non solvable there's no way you know, in which we can, we can solve them. They, are they, are going to, they have the ability to block. And we cannot solve them. Now, the, the last, our last result is the core is empty if and only if every TST will outcome has such a non solvable blocking pair, which is actually equivalent to say that there is a TST will outcome which, with a non solvable blocking pair. Okay, so again, so we study here one side of the same again, which is the, the natural generalization on this one side. Uh, in one side of the environment to the assignment game, the classic assignment game of Shapley and Subic. Uh, we propose this set of optimal testable outcomes as possibly natural solution concept for, for these environments. It keeps all the good properties of the set of testable outcomes when it exists, and it actually also keeps the property when it doesn't exist. 
And uh, the, I can tell you the intuition behind this solution constant is not necessarily linked to, to matching. So we're actually extending this result for general uh, coalitional games. Uh, so with Marilla. So, so again, thanks, thanks again for, for the invitation. It was uh, my, my real pleasure to, to be with you today. Thank you very much, Professor David. Uh, we have uh, some minutes for questions. If you have uh, anyone have a question, please. Yes, Mirna. So uh, is it the case that for a, a, co a partner to have a set of trades, right, and they're partnered, is it the case that uh, given the trades that they make, uh, that that they prefer to be with each other than anybody, any other pit for people they could be with. Right. Like in, that's right, right? Okay. Very interesting. Um, not only to, with or, or anybody else which is much, but also with anybody else which is not much. They, they just don't want to change this trade. They don't want to change, right. Okay, so in some sense, I think, I think there's soulmates, right? I yes. mean, this, you know, so that you're matched. Soulmates form when, say, two people form a coalition or a match, and they're each other's first choice. You remove those from the from the um, set of players, right? They're finished. They're in their trades. Then you look at the remaining population, and you have some more trades like your groups like this, right? And they trade when they're finished. And then some people just, you know, they they maybe have cyclic preferences and so on. Right, so those would be like the people who don't don't form uh, coalitions, right? You are, you are right, but you have to remember that here, uh, typically, this idea of soulmates, etc., is in the in the non-transferable environment where where there is no endogenous surplus sharing. In here, when you when you have a trade, you have to also to decide which is the which is the sharing. So, of course, if I receive too little from this trade, I, I may want to get away, right? Wait, I wasn't wasn't sure I caught that. Um, okay, but but no problem. Um, so, uh, do you have a, is the paper ready? Yeah, it's a paper. I, I will be happy to send it to you, Mirna. Okay, I'm very happy to receive it. Thank you, David. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Mirna. Thank you, David. Uh, any other question? Okay, thank you very much, David. David, and uh, thank, you. We, thank you again. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we want to give uh, the welcome to Professor Alvin Roth. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, he will give us the last talk of this session. Okay, now uh, it's my pleasure to present the next speaker, uh, Professor Mirna Wooders. She's going to present uh, her work interior points of the core, two different approaches. Thank okay. you, Mirna, please. Thank you. Um, let's see. So uh, let's see, I'm trying to make me big so I can figure out how to share my screen. Uh, let's see. I know maybe if I go to, if I go to, uh, a different you view. To, you, to, I mean, you have to, to press the share screen button and select the I window you want to show. Oh, I see. I got it now. I got it now. It's okay. Good. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to try this. Maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. Whoops. That's not what I want. Mm. Um, okay. So that's oh, perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So, yes, this is now on my iPad. I see, I feel very techy. Okay, so um, since we're talking about Marilda, I first really met Marilda at the Game Theory Conference in Stony Brook, and she invited me to come to lunch, and she knew a beautiful restaurant, and we had a lovely talk, and that was many years ago. Um, you know, I mean, you could almost say we were both girls. Okay. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, since then, we've sort of hoped to work together, at least I certainly have, and I think Marilda too, but the opportunity and the time together has just never happened. Okay, so part of my motivation in this presentation is to 
present some work where I think that there is a relationship to some of Marilda's work. And I'm hoping we have some um, young people who are looking for projects who can kind of look into these things. Okay. Um, this incidentally is based on joint work with the Al Winter and uh, Philip Rennie. Okay, in a number of papers. Uh, right. So here's the motivation. Well, there's this paper by Roth and Sotomayor, Interior Points in the Core of Two-Sided Matching Markets in the Journal of Economic Theory. That's where the interior points come. They also come up in, the interior points also come up in, in this paper here, right? Sorry, this paper where we show that uh, the interior of the core coincides of the, or the, with the, what we call the partner core, which is kind of quite different than the partnership as used by David as the term. And, and uh, this property kind of had a number of extensions, the partner core of a game with outside payments, other papers on partnership in our sense, co-authored with Phil Rennie, a Carpenter and Frank Page. But the one I'm really gonna focus on here is this one, and, and uh, we had the opportunity to write a paper for a volume in honor, or yes, in honor of Reinhard Zellen, and it was kind of natural to do this work, furthering our, our work. And, and it has some sort of the spirit actually of some of the things that David was talking about, right? Um, but again, right, somebody could look into this, that would be great. Um, so, Many organizations consist of affiliations of smaller units within the organization, right? Um, like departments within a university or divisions within a company. Uh, and typically exchanges and cooperation must take place between units, these units to realize all gains to collective activities. So we're going to refer to the smaller union as states. Phil and I were from, are both from Canada, so we could have called them provinces. Okay, but states is a more generally known term. And uh, organizations having certain stability properties will be com called commonwealths. Um, and um, Canada is part of the commonwealth, right? Um, certain options are available to states, including the options to secede, like Quebec, right? Thinking of succession. The only trouble is, I think uh, that, that uh, Quebec, Quebec did not have a credible threat, <laughs> okay. And I think that they in fact realized the threat was not credible. Okay, so the model, although the model we employ is that of a cooperative game with outside payments, our notion of the credible core is derived uh, in, to secede, right? In our, no, yeah. uh, our notion of the credible threat to secede is derived from non-cooperative game theory and in particular the writings of Reinhard Selton. So I'm going to go through some of the standard stuff. I'll go through this quite quickly. I'm sure you all know what a game is and characteristic function form. That's a pair N B. Okay, players one to N and, and payoff function B of, um, of the empty set equal to zero. A coalition S. We're going to assume that the game is super additive, so that a, a, a larger coalition can do at least as well as the sum of two disjoint coalitions that comprise a larger coalition. A payoff for a game is a vector, x in Rn, and we define x of s as really just the sum of the uh, payoffs to the individuals, and x is feasible if the x of n is less than or equal to v of n, and it's sufficient if it's equal, x of n is equal to v of n. Um, one of the things I want to say about superadditivity, uh, one should, one can think of this also is that, in fact, that the gain is not superadditive, or what the what the players can realize is, like in the matching literature, the sum of what they can realize in any partition. Okay, so this could be a partition of all of S K could be a partition of all the players, right? And you look at the maximum sum that they could realize if they divide up into coalitions. So a marriage game is like that. Max, what you can achieve is really the maximum you can get in total is what the maximum you can get by forming marriages or partnerships in the sense of the mar of marriage models or matching models. 
A payoff in the court is in the profit sufficient and V of S is greater or equal, X of S is greater or equal to V of S for all coefficients S contained in N. Oh, if anybody has a question, uh, raise your hand or put your little hand up on the screen. Okay, um, and I'll try to answer it, right? Um, and a payoff in the core has a property that is immune to improvements by coalitions. Um, okay, no group of players can withdraw and realize the payoff preferred by all members of the group. Now it is quite different to say that a payoff has a property that no coalition can succeed and simultaneously impose costs on some other subset of the complementary coalition, right? So it's different to say that this coalition can break off and, and leave another coalition out, right? And impose costs on the coalition that's left out. Because uh, why? If a group of players were in such a position, right, that they could drop out and achieve their part of the payoff vector without one of the co coalitional partners, then they, they have an incentive to ask for a larger share of the surplus, right? Um, yes. So if then that group in the hope of achieving a larger share of the total payoff may threaten to leave the total player set and cooperate only with some subset players. Thus, a payoff in the core may not be immune to credible secession. Okay. Even for games with non-empty cores, there may be no payoffs that are immune to secession. Consider a two, one buyer and two seller game where the buyer has a reservation of one for the object and each seller has a reservation price of zero. The core of this game uh, is not empty and gives all the surplus to the buyer, right? Uh, because the, two, the competition between the two sellers makes, um, it leaves them ending up with zero of the surplus or zero of the gains to cooperation. Okay, so there's no feasible payoffs that are immune to secession. So for any payoff given the buyer less than all the surplus, there's a seller who, along with the buyer, can credit credibly threaten to secede, right? This is a sort of standard von Morgan, von Morgan, von Neumann Morgan string of an example like this. If the buyer receives all the surplus, the two sellers can credibly threaten to secede, right? Because they're not getting anything. So they might as well drop out, they can secede. Okay, but as soon as they, as soon as uh, one of them or both of them get some of the surplus, then the other one can compete. Okay, one of them can compete and try to get a larger share. Um, so such considerations motivate our de definition of the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth Court. I'm going to formally now define threats to secession. Um, let X be an efficient payoff. S can credibly threaten to secede if for some coalition T, uh, S union T can give, give both S and T their part of X. And for some coalition Q, it's joint from S union T, that coalition Q is hurt, right? For all, all for all, it cannot, there is not another coalition R that will give, um, will give Q its share of S. Okay, Q needs S. Q needs S because if it doesn't have S, it can't get its, its X of, of Q, X of Q. Without X or without S, X of, X for Q is not feasible for Q. With any other partnership, with any other group of players, right? Um, that it could form with. So by seceding, S can hurt coalition Q regardless of how the players in N minus S might subsequently operate or, co or cooperate. So this is really a credible threat. If no coalition can credibly threaten to secede, X is immune to secession. A payoff is cohesive 
if it is efficient, efficient and immune to secession. Okay. Okay. Um, suppose if this is a super additive game, then every cohesive payoff is a core payoff. Suppose not. Then X is cohesive, right? But not in the core, but not in the game. Then there exists an S, so that X of S, but not in the core, sorry. Then there exists S with X of S less than V of S. By super additivity and efficiency, uh, x of s plus x to the n minus s, s is equal to v of n, and that's greater or equal to v of s plus v of n minus s. So rearranging, we have x of s minus v of s is greater than v of n minus s minus x of n minus s. Okay, that's just rearranging. Okay, since this first term, uh, x of s minus v of s is less than zero, it follows that this part of it is less than zero. Okay. V of n minus s minus x of n minus s is less than zero. And taking, um, yes, t equal to the empty set and q equal to n minus s, this contradicts the property that x is cohesive. Okay. Uh, because Right. The players, if it's cohesive, in some sense, the players have to stick together. So, so uh, if the players have to stick together to realize the efficient payoff, then they all need each other and the core is not empty. Okay. So as illustrated earlier, not in the introduction, sorry about that. Because I did it earlier, right? There are games with non-empty cores having no payoffs that are cohesive. That was the one buyer, two seller example. So now we'll get to partnership. Partnership turns out to be a very interesting condition. Um, so we have, let the P be a collection of subsets of N. For each I and N, define P of I as a set of subsets that contain player I. So P has a partnership property for N, if for each I and N, the set PI is not empty, and for each J and I and N, this is the important part, if P I is contained in PJ, if I is in all the part, in all the coalitions containing P, then J, pardon me, if I is in all the coalitions containing J, then J is in all the coalitions containing I. They go together, right? Um, if you see I hanging around, then you're gonna see J with them, okay? Um, as I said, all the coalitions in T that contain I also contain J, contain J and vice versa. So a payoff is partnered if the collection of coalitions containing that payoff or supporting, sorry, supporting that payoff has the partnership property. Okay. Um, so nobody, nobody really needs anybody then, right? Uh, because if, if I needs J and J needs I, in some sense, they both need the others. So it's very symmetric. It's symmetric in a sense. So Rennie Winter and I showed that the relative interior of the core of a game with side payments is contained in the partnered core. And that's my hook word. Okay. So there's a paper by Roth and Sotomayor also deals with the interior of the core to some extent. Um, okay, there's been more work on the partnered core and, it's, and, and it goes up to, in fact, an extension of the KKMS theorem by Rennie Wooders and a further extension with Kanai, or Yukar Kanai and myself, right? So, so it sort of started out, we started out with this rather simple result and then got very complicated. Okay. So now we get to commonwealths. Okay, we've talked about credible threatens to secede and now a commonwealth. Well, the commonwealth basically is a set of states with the property that um, um, 
no state can credibly threaten to secede. So here, here we have this, I needs J for X, if for all coalitions, X of S is less than or equal to V of S and I together imply that J and S is an element of S. Okay, so X is feasible for V of S and if I is in, the, in this coalition, then so is an S and so is J. If I needs J and J needs I, I and J are partners, or that is, right, with, for, with the, uh, X. For fixed X, the relation with this relation, X is partnered with, is an equivalence relation on the planar set, right? And we call each equivalence class a partnership. What's happened? Oh, I know, I have my race on. Okay. So each equivalence class is a partnership. So for every, every equivalence class, all the players in the, in, the, in the class need each other. So we let NX denote the unique partition of N into states in which each state consists of a partnership relative to X. A state can credibly threaten to secede if, 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 um, Yes, a state NK can credibly threaten to secede from NX, right? If NK can credibly threaten to secede in the sense we had uh, earlier, right? Credible threats of secession, but not only, only, we're thinking only of secession by groups of players who are partnerships, who comprise of, who need each other. They all need each other within that. Um, if, yes, and these threats of secession are made by states. If no state can credibly threaten to secede, then NX is called a Commonwealth partition. Thinking back to uh, thinking back to the Canadian example, the view was in Canada when when these referendums on Quebec seceding, um, uh, the, the view was that well, if it's if Quebec seceded from Canada, it'd probably end up joining the United States, which may or may not have been better for it. Um, but but uh, Quebec seems more Canadian than American, at least to me. Okay. So the Commonwealth Corps is, is the, for a game, it's NX is a Commonwealth, is a Commonwealth if X is in the core of the game and NX is a Commonwealth partition. Now, X is in the Commonwealth core if there is a partition such that the pair of that is a Commonwealth. That's a little redundant. Okay. So here, this is the main theorem of the paper in some respects, uh, but um, of this paper in some respects, but it's, uh, uh, right. I don't include the proof because the proof is kind of complicated, right? You know, it has a lot of equations and stuff like that. It's the kind of thing Marilda just eats up, right? I mean, you know, uh, and is very happy doing it. But uh, uh, <laughs> but anyway, she's not here, which is important, fortunate. So now I'm going to get to a conjecture. Okay. Um, so in Els and Marilda's paper on interior points in the core, the, on interior points in the core of matching game, that paper demonstrates the same sort of polarization of interests as the man optimal and the woman optimal matching. I think I'm, that's not well written. Let me see this. That the same sort of polarization of interests. As, as the man optimal and woman optimal matchings in a matching game holds for anterior points in the core of a matching game. So my conjecture is that the same polarization occurs in the partner core, right? Um, which is, you know, an open, open question. Uh, the reason for this is like for a TU game, 
to set up, there's a finite number of payoffs in each of these, and where each of these payoffs is where at least one player is realizing their minimum core payoff. So at each of those points describing, say, this convex core, that's the convex set, believe it or not. Okay. Almost convex. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so any point in the core is really a convex combination of, of the payoffs determined by these by these points. Okay. So so you can see there's kind of a competition or a conflict of interest in some directions. Okay, but but. Is that it's a maybe, not for sure. Okay. Um, one of the things that really surprised me, and actually, uh, is kind of how much this partnership property that we talk about occurs. And in fact, we discovered that uh, this partnership property of collections of sets first appeared in Nashler and Pelligan's papers, and Nashler, Pelligan, Shapley in their study of the kernel of a cooperative game. And the, they, the concern, their concern was separating out players. Okay, so they would call a partner collection a separating collection and two players, I and J are inseparable in if, in, if in our terminology, they're partners. But our partner core was motivated on desire to focus for co on coalition formation we use the term partnership of El Elbers, Bennett, and Bennett and Zane. And as uh, a partnership is not the same as a coalition structure, as a coalition and a coalition structure, right? Because in the, these partners, people in a partnership need each other. Um, yes, and each coalition is self sufficient in, in that kind of in a coalition partition game. Okay. And and the Kinenko, this kind of approach in these papers does not address why there are organizations consisting of distinct subunits, such as states that are not necessarily um, self-contained. And these papers, in some of the earlier papers here, we provide a number of examples uh, mentioned. Oh, right. Uh, and it actually also comes up in the study of competitive equilibrium with convexity of preferences. Uh, Competitive equilibrium as partner. And the ones that really surprised me when actually when we really this partnership profit to the Canaster, Kurkowski, Mezerkowitz, Theorem, KKMS. Okay. And then references. And I think I finished just about our time. Thank you. Thank you again so much for this opportunity to present to this group. And I do want to send my very best wishes to Marilda and her husband and her whole family and hope that we can see each other again in the not too distant future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mirna, for your presentation. It was very interesting. And we have some minutes for questions. If anybody has a question. So does anybody have a conjecture? <laughs> <laughs> Too soon to ask, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much again. And... Uh... Oh, okay, I think I'm gonna stop share now. Uh, I think that there is a question in the text. The I'm, chat. I'm trying to stop share now. Stop share. Here it is. Okay, very good. Okay. Now Marilda will appreciate this, but you know, I left the party early where I had just a few people dancing, right? If I'd have stayed longer. I bet I could have done a lot of them dancing, and it was great fun. Marilda and I have danced a lot together. It's one of the things I love about Marilda's conference is the hours of dancing. Well, that's right. 
Okay, thanks again. And um, now uh, it's my pleasure and an honor to introduce the last speaker. Uh, Professor Arvin Roth is going to present uh, the uh, paper Stable and Almost Stable Matching in Centralized and Decentralized Markets. Please, Professor Alvin. Very good. Let me, let me share my screen. Uh, How's that? Are you are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, so I want to tell you about two papers uh, that involves both involve stable matchings, and one of them also involves almost stable matchings. And the first paper is the famous paper by Gale and Shapley that began the the study of two sided matching, and that has. Um, formed the basis of, of designing labor market clearinghouses and other kinds of clearinghouses like school choice clearinghouses uh, that are now used widely around the world. And, and those are centralized marketplaces. And the second paper is Marilda's 1996 paper uh, that she called a non-constructive elementary proof of the existence of stable marriages. But I want to argue for you that, that the paper does much more than, than just give a non-constructive proof that um, that Gale and Shapley gave constructively with the deferred acceptance algorithm, but that Merlda's paper also organized, or also proposes a class of outcomes that we're going to have to consider when we study decentralized markets, markets that uh, may not have time to go through uh, lots of offers and acceptances and rejections before having to agree on contracts. So I'm going to tell you some background on the, on the set of stable matchings from, from my 1990 book with Marilda. And um, in fact, I found this photograph from 2010 when we were celebrating the 20th anniversary of the book. And now it's, it's more than 30 years. So the book, like its authors, is now middle-aged. And the, the workhorse model in the book, in the first part of the book, is is this college admissions model with what I'll call responsive strict preferences. And I'll get to that in a minute. But the basic idea already laid out in Gale and Shapley's paper is that you have a set of firms and a set of workers. And these are, uh, these are disjoint sets. So this is a two-sided matching market. We, we know at the outset who are the firms and who are the workers. And each firm has some quota of positions, some number of positions that it might want to fill. And sometimes when I speak of the firms, I'll say firms, sometimes I'll say hospitals, sometimes I'll say colleges, and I'll talk about workers, workers and doctors and students, because these are all applications in which um, clearing houses that, that use the deferred acceptance algorithm that I'll, I'll remind you of, uh, have been used. And the basic uh, tools of this model, the basic elements of the model are that uh, on each side of the market, people have preferences over individuals on the other side of the market. So that firm I is able to say things like, my first choice is worker three and my second choice is worker two. And I have a list of choices, it's complete and transitive, but at some point I might prefer to leave a position vacant. And I'll, I'll signal that by putting firm I in firm I's own preferences. So firm I finds unacceptable all people who he, uh, who he would, uh, prefer to keep a position vacant than, than to hire. And similarly, Worker J can say who, who's his favorite firm and, and next favorite. And at some point, Worker J may prefer to remain unmatched to, to not take a job with any of these firms. Uh, and an outcome of the game is a matching from firms and workers into firms and workers that matches firms to workers and workers to firms. And it's, it's a matching in the sense that if Worker W is matched to firm F, then, uh, then firm F hires worker W and for mu of F, the set of workers matched to firm F is a set that has to not be greater than the number of workers that firm F is able to hire, not, not greater than its quota. And the matching is two-sided in the sense that people on one side have to be matched to people on the other side. So a worker is either matched to a firm or to herself, right? That, that's how I'll denote someone being unmatched. And uh, F is matched to a set of workers, mu of F. And just in case all the quotas are one, when, when each firm wants to hire only one uh, person, we'll call that the marriage model. It's sort of a mnemonic. And then I'll refer not to, not to firms and workers, but sometimes to men and women, just as a way of remembering that we're talking about one-to-one -one matching. And 
when we're not talking about one-to-one -one matching, we'll have to say a little more about preferences over sets because firms will hire um, multiple workers. And the, today I'll keep it very simple. I'll talk about responsive preferences, which is to say the, the, the preferences of firms over sets of workers has to be responsive to their preferences over individual workers in the following way. If we look at two sets of workers uh, that differ in only one worker, W versus W prime, then we'll say firm I prefers the, the set with worker W to worker W prime, if and only if in the individual preferences, he likes worker W rather than W prime. And that rules out some kinds of complementarities. And there are more general ways of ruling out those complementarities. Uh, we'll also say that, that uh, firm I prefers to hire worker W uh, in, into a position only if W is acceptable to, to firm I. If he's on uh, firm I's list of preferences before, more preferred than, than leaving a position vacant. Okay, so that allows us to talk about both stable and envy-free matchings. And, and those are really the topics of those two papers that, that I talked to for, about first Gale and Shapley and then uh, Marilda's paper. And we'll say a matching mu is individually irrational if it matches unacceptable people, if it matches a worker and a firm such that either the worker is unacceptable to the firm or the firm is unacceptable to the, to the worker. Here I say student, but there you go. Uh, and a matching is blocked by a pair of agents, a firm and a worker, if they each prefer the other to their match at the matching mu. So, it's, so when we talk about a matching being blocked, we, we have a specific matching mu in mind. And for it to be blocked, first of all, the worker has to prefer the firm to whoever the worker is matched to at mu. And then one of two things has to happen. Either the firm looks at worker W and says, you know, I would rather hire worker W than worker W prime who, who I was supposed to hire at mu. And if F prefers W to the current worker, and of course, W prefers F to, to the current, uh, to his current firm or, or, or to being unmatched, uh, then we might say that, that uh, worker W has a justifiable envy of worker W prime. Worker W prime is holding at mu a, a position that, that worker W would like and, uh, and firm F would, would actually have preferred to hire W rather than W prime. So that envy is gonna be actionable. They'll form a blocking pair. And the other way to form a blocking pair is if worker W prefers F and F prefers W to leaving a position vacant, and he had a position vacant at mu, right? So here, here are two people who want to work with each other, and, and there's nothing stopping them because, because F can hire another person. And a matching is stable if it's individually rational and not blocked by a, patient, by a pair of agents in either of these two ways. And in the, fir in the first way, I'll call being envy-free. A matching is envy-free if it's individually rational and has no blocking pairs of type one, where, where worker W has justifiable envy against worker W prime. But I'll say a matching is envy-free, even if it's not stable, because it can have blocking pairs of type two. That is, there can be unfilled positions that the firm and the worker would be glad to fill. So, so this is stability, except with empty positions. That is, uh, if there are any blocking pairs, they involve an unfilled position. Okay, so any firm and worker in a blocking pair will have an unfilled position. And uh, notice the set of envy free matchings is, is always not empty, not only because we already know from Gale and Shapley that the set of stable matchings is not empty and, and stable matchings are obviously envy, envy free, but so is the empty matching when no one is matched to anyone, when all firm positions are vacant. So we get for free that the set of Envy free matchings is non empty. And Galen Shapley uh, showed us the deferred acceptance algorithm, which allows us to, to show that for any preferences, uh, the set of stable matchings is non empty. Uh, and it also gives us a way of constructing such a stable matching. So here's their algorithm. Let me remind you of it. I'm, I'm sure it's very familiar. Uh, and, and let me just remark that I'm going to, since I've got a well, I'm going to talk about decentralized markets later, but right now I'm talking about a centralized clearinghouse run by a computer. So although I'm gonna talk about firms and workers doing things, what firms and workers actually do when, when we're running a centralized clearinghouse is they submit preference lists. 
That's the actions of firms and workers to submit preference lists. And then the, the computer conducts the following operations on whatever preferences are submitted. If some of the preferences aren't strict, it breaks ties so that there are no more uh, non-strict preferences. And each firm that has Q positions, say five positions, make offers to its top five choices if it has if it has five acceptable choices. And each worker rejects any unacceptable offers. And if more than one acceptable offer is received, holds the most preferred and rejects all the others. And notice the, the rejections are immediate. If you get more offers than you have capacity, you, you reject them. Uh, uh, and if you're a worker, you just have, have capacity one, but you don't immediately accept the offer. That's why it's called the deferred acceptance algorithm. You're gonna hold the offer to see what other offers might come in. And the offers that might come in are from firms rejected by, by the workers they made offers to. And now they make offers to the next worker on their preference list. And uh, each worker holds her most preferred acceptable offer to date. That is just looking at her rank order list, she, she orders them and, and the best one yet she holds on to and rejects the rest. And the algorithm stops when no further proposals are made and it matches each worker to the firm whose offer she's holding. So these, these holds now become acceptances. They're deferred until the algorithm stops. And Galen Shapley observed, and, and we all know now that, that a stable matching exists for every profile of individual preferences. And it's easy to see that this algorithm produces such a matching because supposing I'm a, a, a firm and I, make an offer to you and you reject it, I would rather have hired you than someone who I hired, but you wouldn't rather work for me. You rejected me when you got an offer you preferred. So the final outcome is always stable and therefore a stable matching always exists. And in fact, Alan Shapley observed that the, not only do the stable, the stable matchings always exist, but they have a structure. There's, we can make welfare statements about them. There's always a man optimal and a woman optimal stable matching, a firm optimal and a, a worker optimal stable matching. And which side of the algorithm is proposing gets their optimal stable match. And this is a pretty remarkable result because, the, the, because optimal stable matchings exist, which means all the workers agree on the best stable matching and all the firms agree on it on a perhaps different uh, stable matching, but the firms all agree. And this is surprising because there aren't, there aren't worker or firm optimal stable matchings. It's only when we impose stability that we get this the, these coordination of, of interests on the sides of the market. And that has to do with the fact, originally I think observed by John Conway, that when all preferences are strict, the set of stable matchings is a lattice ordered by the common preference of one side. So at the top of that lattice, if, if we're looking at the common preferences of the man, or the, is the man optimal stable matching? At the bottom is, is the, the woman optimal stable matching. But that same uh, coincidence of, you know, commonality of, of preferences can be found in a partial ordering throughout the lattice. And that's something that Marilda has spent a lot of time studying. Uh, you know, here's one of several of her papers that, that find the lattice property to be very general in matching problems of all sorts. So, um, so that lattice property is pretty interesting because it, it gives us some idea about the, the structure of the core, the structure of the set of stable outcomes in, in the marriage problem. And then uh, in, in, in the more general uh, worm and firm and worker many to one matching problem. So, so Galen Shapley gave us a constructive proof that the set of stable matchings is not empty. And now comes Marilda's 1996 paper. And she says, you know, uh, Galen Shapley showed that a stable matching always exists. And their proof was constructed by the deferred acceptance algorithm. But it's funny that we have an existence proof that depends on a, on a construction rather than on some general property of of matchings. And she says the purpose of her paper is to present a non-constructive proof of the existence of stable matching for the marriage market. And it's short and simple, and it applies directly to when there are strict and non-strict preferences. And, and so she emphasizes that her proof is non-constructive, that it's not going to uh, be phrased to us in terms of an algorithm. And here's the proof. It is indeed you know, extraordinarily simple. She says the matching mu is simple if in the case of a blocking pair, in case there's a blocking pair of a man and a woman, we're, we're in the context of the, of the marriage problem here. If there is a blocking pair, it always involves a single woman, a woman who's not matched. So this is what I called envy-free. Uh, 
that is that if, if we think of the, the women as the firms, we're, we're, we would be generalizing it to say the, the woman has a, um, an empty position. Okay, so, so we're gonna look at that special case and notice that we immediately know that simple matchings, the set is not empty because the matching where everyone is single is a simple matching. Okay, and here's, here's the proof that the set of stable matchings exist. That is the set of stable matchings that there aren't even any of these, block, the set of simple matchings, sorry, we're gonna prove that a stable matching exists, which is to say that the set of simple matchings, the matchings that have blocking pairs only involving single women must also contain a stable matching that is a matching with that has no blocking pairs at all. And here's the proof. She says, let mu be some weakly Pareto optimal matching for the men among the simple matching. So we have a finite set of matchings. We're just gonna look at the Pareto set, the ones that you can't, that, that are the matchings that are simple, but have the property that you can't make some man better off without hurting other men, okay? And we claim that mu is stable, in fact. And she says, suppose not, then mu is blocked by some man and woman where the woman is single because it's a simple matching and choose M such that, that M is the, one of the favorite blocking partners of woman W. That is choose M such that if, if another blocking pair M prime W also blocks mu, then W doesn't prefer M prime to M. So she may not have strict preferences, but, but man M maximizes her preferences over blocking pairs. And now we create a new matching by, by, by matching woman W to man M, who's, who's one of her favorite blocking pairs. Uh, and, and in case man M was already matched at mu, his spouse at mu becomes sing single. And for everything else, this new matching mu prime is just the same as mu. So we, we make, we, we look at the blocking pair, we satisfy it and create a new matching and leave everybody else alone. And, uh, and notice that this is a Pareto improvement of from the point of view of the men, because man M is better off and no other men are change their matching. So this is a Pareto improvement. And um, if it weren't stable, a further Pareto improvement would be possible. Hence, it must be stable, right? If, if there were, if, if, if we had this matching and we could find another blocking pair that, that involved M and W who is single, then we could make a Pareto improvement since we're on a Pareto we're already at a Pareto optimal matching for the men, it must be stable. There can't be any such blocking pairs. So this set of stable matchings is not empty. Now, Marilda in her paper and in the title of her paper describes this as a non-constructive proof, but of course there's an algorithm implicit in Marilda's proof. And, and I wanna to talk to you about that algorithm. Uh, so here's the, here's the algorithm. Start with a simple matching mu one that has only blocking pairs that involve single women, unmatched women. If mu is unstable, so if there is such a blocking pair, then there's a woman W who's part of some blocking pair and who, and who is single. And let MW be one of W's most preferred such blocking pairs and create a new matching mu prime, just as, as Marilda did. Create a new matching mu prime from, from mu that has M and W matched at mu prime and M's mate, if any, at mu unmatched and everyone else is the same as at mu. Then mu prime is another simple matching, right? That all men liked at least as well as mu. Why is it a simple matching? Because when you marry off man M and woman W, you don't create any new block, you, you stop W from being in, in any blocking pairs because, uh, and now that she's matched in a simple matching, she shouldn't be able to be in any blocking pairs because you've matched her to her most preferred blocking pair. So she can't do any better than that. And the other men aren't in blocking pairs, except perhaps with the woman who used to be married to man M. And, and that would be okay. In a simple matching, you can have blocking pairs uh, that involve an unmatched woman and she's now unmatched. So mu prime is a simple matching that all men like at least as well as mu. That is, it's a Pareto improvement and man M strictly prefers. And if mu prime is stable, then we stop if we don't find any blocking pairs. And otherwise we go back and we do it again, starting with mu prime. We, we create a Pareto improvement that's also simple. And this algorithm uh, always stops at a stable matching. It can only stop at a stable matching and it must stop because the men do better at every step. So it can only go a finite number of steps uh, because there are only a finite number of matchings. So, so here's an algorithm implicit in, in Merilda's proof that tells us how to start from an arbitrary um, 
simple matching and get to a stable matching. And notice that the deferred acceptance algorithm starts with the matching where everyone is unmatched. That's a particular simple matching. But here's an algorithm that says you can start at any stable matching and, uh, and any simple matching and get to a stable matching. Okay, so I, I want to explore the consequences of that a little bit. But before I do, notice that because we're talking about two-sided matching, I could also have, instead of just defining the simple matchings that I have in which, in which blocking pairs involve an unmatched woman, I could talk about blocking pairs that involve an unmatched man. That would have the same mathematical structure, but I'm going to be, I'll stick with, with women here. And similarly, when we're, when we're talking about many-to-one matching, uh, I can talk about... Uh, the firms having uh, having unmatched positions and, and the only blocking pairs involve those. And that's what I called NB free in my, in my first slides. Uh, but you could also go the other way. If you've got hospitals and doctors, we can also look at the matchings that, that involve an unmatched doctor. Okay, so, so I'll come back a little to this in the end, but for the moment, I'm gonna be thinking about hospital quasi-stable matchings, these NB free matchings where every firm, if there's a blocking pair, it involves the unmatched position of a firm. Okay, and so uh, Ching Yun Wu and I uh, wrote a paper that, that just came out in 2018 on this. And we're talking about matchings that are envy free in the sense that every blocking pair involves an empty position. We're talking about firms and workers here. And the theorem is that the set of envy free matchings is a joint semi lattice under the common preferences of the workers. That's, that's uh, an observation about, about these. So just as the set of stable matchings is a lattice, the set of uh, simple matchings, the set of, of envy free matchings is gonna be a lattice. And what, that, what I mean by that is if mu and mu prime are any two envy free matchings, you can create a new envy free matching by, which will be the join of mu and mu prime by assigning each doctor to his more preferred hospital between mu and mu prime. And this is also an envy free matching. So it's a matching and it's envy free. And the proof is simple. Uh, it, it's individually rational in the sense that it doesn't violate the capacity constraints of any hospital because neither mu nor mu prime violated the capacity constraints. They were both simple matchings. And if it should happen, if, if, if you think it might happen that, that they that at these two different matchings, they both prefer the same hospital and that will uh, uh, overwhelm the capacity of that hospital. It must be that that hospital, which prefers one to the other, I'm, I'm assuming strict preferences here, uh, and, and that would cause one of these to be unstable with respect to a blocking pair that isn't allowed in NB free matching. So, so, uh, so lambda is an individually rational matching and it's NB free, uh, because if not, if there were a, a, an unallowed blocking pair to lambda, it, it would block one of mu or mu prime also. So, so this is a way of going from uh, two NV free matchings to, one, to a third NV free matching that's better than both of them from the point of view of the doctors. And the, the a, a fact about finite lattices is that if they have a minimum and they're a joint semi lattice, then they're a lattice. And the, the minimum with respect to the doctor's pre preferences is the empty matching at which everyone is single. So these, these matchings have, the, this uh, lattice has a maximum for the doctors, it's the doctor optimal stable matching, and it has a minimum, the matching at which uh, no one is matched. And this is quite a different lattice than the lattice that we've come to love uh, of stable matchings, because the lattice of stable matchings, the preferences of the men and the women are duals of each other. And the, the top is the man optimal stable matching and the bottom is the woman optimal stable matching. And here we've got one where the top is the, the doctor optimal stable matching and the bottom is the matching where no one is matched to anyone, everyone is single. And let's take a look at the preferences here. Notice that doctor, there are two doctors and, and three hospitals. Notice that doctor one and two have different uh, first choices, which aren't acceptable to each other, but they both have the, the same last choice, uh, which is hospital two. Uh, and, and as I say, the preferences are the, the lattice uh, isn't dual, the means and joins, meets and joins. Um, and, and indeed, you can't use the normal. Uh, the normal uh, meet, right? Because look at at uh, 
at outcomes uh, ENF, you could uh, you could define a ma- you could try to define a matching that would say let's give each doctor their less preferred outcome at ENF, and and Doctor One's less preferred outcome is Hospital Two, and Doctor Two's less preferred outcome is Hospital Two, and there is no matching it with, it, with which they're both matched to Hospital Two. In this example, the hospitals have have. Uh, capacity of one. So the the lattice that we're familiar with of stable matchings is not the same lattice as the lattice that we're seeing in the simple matchings. Okay. Um, Now, why are these things going to be important? Well, simple matchings occur in, in natural ways in markets. And one way they can occur is supposing we have a labor market that produces a stable matching of firms to workers. And now some incumbent some worker retires. So we had what was a stable matching, but now we've extracted a worker from a position that he was in and and the matching will no longer be stable. There are people who would like his empty position. So we have an envy free, but unstable matching. And we can start to watch the the vacancy chains. What happens when, you know, if, if, uh, if I leave Stanford, there'll be an empty position at Stanford, and maybe Stanford will hire someone from Harvard, and then there'll be an empty position at Harvard. So there'll be a, a, a vacancy chain that, that can be filled. And that turns out to be a Tarski operator on the set of envy free matchings. So, uh, so let me define the Tarski operator, that is a function from the lattice to itself that is monotone and therefore will converge to a fixed point, which will be a stable matching. Right. So, uh, so here we are, we have an envy free matching and we let, we look at all the blocking pairs, which all involve empty positions in firms and B1 is the, the set of hospitals favorite blocking pairs of among those and B2 is the set of doctors favorite blocking pairs among those among the hospitals favorite. This is the, the, we didn't need, we didn't need the first construction in Marilda's proof, but this is what will make the, the operator a Tarski operator, will make it isotone on the, on the lattice. Uh, and we define T as uh, taking an envy free lattice uh, and, and uh, finding all the doctors who form blocking pairs with, with hospitals and, and matching them up, making the, making the new matching where, where all the doctors are, are better off and uh, we still get a matching and it's an isotone matching. So, and it has a fixed point only if there are no blocking pairs, only if it's actually stable. So Tarski's theorem is gonna tell us that, uh, that uh, there's a fixed point of this uh, operator that is the set of stable matchings. And that will tell us that the set of stable matchings is a non-empty lattice with respect to the doctor's common preferences. That's something we already knew, but here it comes from the fact that the set of NV free matchings are a lattice. Uh, Previous proofs of this looked at things that weren't matchings, that were bigger than matchings, pre-matchings, things like that. Okay, so uh, the starting point matters, you know, who retires matters. So when when this converges, it doesn't converge to the to the hospital optimal stable matching, it confers to the join of the matching we started at and the hospital optimal stable matching. So it's history dependent. It doesn't, uh, when when mu is the empty matching, this Tarski operation uh, performs the deferred acceptance algorithm. But when it's some other matching, it it performs vacancy chains and gets to an outcome that, that can reflect where it started. Okay, now I should mention that the, the other direction, the, the, the quasi-stable matchings that, um, that involve doctors who are unmatched in every blocking pair, uh, that's recently been studied in a paper that hasn't been published yet. Uh, it's on the archive. Uh, and, and they show that, uh, that these matchings are also a lattice and there's, there's also a Tarski operator. They have to use a different ordering on the, the partial ordering for the lattice than the one, the simple one that I showed you. But, but uh, in both directions, the envy free matchings are, are lattices and, um, and, and can lead to processes that, that, that can create processes that converge to stable matchings. Now, let me, let me end by, by saying why I think this is important for economics, because so far I've told you about the deferred acceptance algorithm as 
an algorithm for a centralized clearinghouse, but it's written as if it could be a protocol for a decentralized market. That is, each firm does something, it makes offers, and each worker accepts some, holds some, and rejects others, and eventually it stops. And, and in the centralized clearinghouse run by a computer, it stops when no further proposals are made. But in a decentralized market, it may stop when time runs out. Right. So so here in, in the academic market for economists, we're now starting our labor market where we where we hire new assistant professors and Stanford is going to interview 25 people and we're going to invite probably five of them out to uh, to talk to us on campus and then we'll make offers to maybe two of them. And if we fail to hire those two, we'll leave a position vacant and wait for next year. So so uh, deferred acceptance protocols run in a decentralized way, and I've, I've studied some of them, like the one for, for a psychologist, uh, are too slow and time runs out before they converge to stable matchings. And if you think about the deferred acceptance process as something that can be terminated at the end of any step before, before it runs out of offers that need to be made, then you'll notice that, that the matching that results when you stop the deferred acceptance algorithm prematurely is envy free it's stable except for vacant positions. So when, you know, in a telephone market, when the phone calls stop, when the time runs out, the matching is envy free, but not stable. And therefore in many markets, the matchings we observe may be envy free, but unstable, right? And when we run centralized clearinghouses, we overcome the time intensive process. We, we have plenty of time because in a centralized clearinghouse, it works at computer speed, but also everyone has made their decisions in advance. They've submitted preference rankings in advance. They don't have to wait and think about which of these two offers I've got should I hold and, and which one should I, uh, should I let go. Uh, and so, so here I am back ending on my last slide at, at Marilda's paper. Uh, she introduces these envy free matchings and in decentralized labor markets, which is to say most labor markets, most labor markets aren't run by centralized clearinghouses, Marilda's simple matchings, matchings in which any blocking pairs involve empty positions may be important objects of study in their own right. I think when we look at the market for new PhD economists, we're gonna see it close before all the positions are filled. And those positions will be around next year. Uh, and, and what we might be looking at is not stable matchings, but envy free matchings. So, so I think that Marilda's paper opens up the prospect that, that we economists can study um, decentralized markets with some of the same tools that we've used to study centralized markets, but different ideas about what the market converges to. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Alvin Roth. Now we have uh, some minutes for questions. I don't have a question, hi Al, but I, I'm happy, I'm happy to see the, the paper because actually the Marilla's 96 paper is also the origin of the paper I just presented, uh, not, not, for, uh, not, not for NTU game, matching game, but, uh, but for the assignment, in our case, the one side assignment game, but still we, we, we started from the, same, uh, from the same area, so it was very nice that without coordination, we, we coordinated it in some yeah. basic areas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And again, you know, your paper was about cases where stable matchings may not exist. So we have to think about um, other other notions than stability because stability may, may the set of stable matching may be empty. I'm taking a different point of view. I'm looking at markets where we know that stable matchings exist, but they may be hard to reach. And so we might want to, when we, when we try to understand what's going on in the market, relax the notion of stability. Right. Thank you. Oh, Any other? Nice. Yeah. Oh, hmm? Any other question? No. Okay. Uh, ah, we have uh, Bruna Mendoza. He raises his hand. Her hand. Uh, please, Bruna. Your phone is, uh, your microphone is uh, disactivated. Uh, Luisa or Rodrigo, can 
can help us with uh, Bruna's question. She has her microphone off. I allowed her to talk, but um, I don't think she she's saying anything. Okay, well, maybe something missing. Okay, thank you very much once again, Professor Alvin Roth. It was very good to have you, all of you here. Uh, it's uh, uh, more than a meeting of uh, uh, professionals, prestigious professionals and uh, colleagues and co-authors. Uh, I think that it's more than uh, friends uh, of Marilda. And uh, we will have now the final words uh, bringing by Mauricio Bugarin, which is also a very good friend and co-author of uh, Marilda. And uh, he will uh, bring the final words and the session closure. Please, Mauricio. Thank you very much. Uh, today we are, we are celebrating Marilda Sotomayor, who is a gift to economic theory, to Brazilian academics and to the world academics as well. I thank and peg in Professor Wilfredo Maldonado for organizing this session. And I thank professors Aloysio Araújo, David Perez Castrillo, Mirna Wooders, and Alvin Roth for kindly honoring Marilda with your great presentations. I first met Marilda in the late 1990s, actually in one of those UNPEC SBA annual meetings. And we soon initiated a long co collaboration that we kept active to present. It started with two projects. One is the first Brazilian workshop of the Game Theory Society in 2002. It is not worthy that Roger Meyerson and Robert Allman came to this event before becoming Nobel laureates. So if you, you wish to get the nomination, you may want to come to one of Marilda's conferences. We also started writing a book on game theory that we called Lições em Teoria dos Jogos for the Brazilian academic audience, which we strategically keep revising to make sure that our partnership never ends. <laughs> Then, in 2010, I helped Marilda organize the second Brazilian workshop of the Game Theory Society that honored the 60th anniversary of the Nash Equilibrium concept. Four econ economists, economics Nobel laureates came Meyerson, Maskin, Milgram, and of course, Nash. In the words of Nash himself, it was the first time he traveled south of the equator. <laughs> I also helped Marilda organize the 2014 International Workshop of the Game Theory Society, to which Almond, Maskin, Nash, and Avin Ross came. So Marilda, I guess it's time to start planning for the next Game Theory Society workshop in Brazil. In, prepare, in preparing for these closing statements, I could notice that this is also the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Marilda's completion of her doctorate, which she concluded very quickly. Congratulations, Marilda, on that 40th anniversary. Since concluding her PhD, Marilda has built an impressive career. Part of her curriculum has been presented by uh, Professor Wilfredo Maldonado and the colleagues in this session. If I were to single out one specific characteristic of Marilda, I would select for sure her ability to solve difficult mathematical problems very quickly. That was the case when Professor Aloisio suggested a problem for her doctorate. It was expected that it would take uh, Marilda several months to solve that problem, but she solved it within weeks. That was also the case when Marilda went to work with Gale and proved the famous, now famous blocking lemma in one single weekend. Uh, and that has also been the experience with Professor Ross that started their fruitful partnership. Uh, there is a lot to, to say about Marilda, but let me finish reminiscing a comment that another collaborator of Gale, Ahmed Alcan, told us in our first Brazilian workshop of the Game Theory Society in 2002. It refers to the time when Marilda first visited Gale in the 1980s. 
according to Professor Ahmed Alkan, Gail told him something like this. Have you met my new Brazilian postdoc? She's quite good looking and she solves all my math problems. <laughs> <laughs> Marilda, you will remain a beautiful, you remain a beautiful person, a beautiful soul, and you will always be incredibly good at quickly solving hard math problems. We now conclude this session in honor of Marilda Sotomayor. Let me invite all of us to have a big round of applause for Marilda. Okay. Nice now, to Wilfredo. see everybody again. Goodbye, everyone, and be free to join with us. Goodbye. Good. Thank you very much to all of you. So next you time, next time. It, it will be in Sao Paulo or Rio or somewhere. Next time. Yeah, please. <laughs> the next <laughs> <will> workshop <laughs> organized yeah. by Marilda. <laughs> it will be a very a nice idea. pleasure to receive Good you here. Organizer. And thank you for inviting me and congratulations to the organizer. Hey. Thank you hey. very much. Hello, you still. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much for the presentations. Can I end thank this you, session? Thank you, for yes. your support. Uh, Professor Alvin, David, thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. See you the next time.